This is Curl Up with a Cat Tale, and I'm Gwen Cooper, the New York Times bestselling author of numerous cat-centric titles, including Homer's Odyssey, A Fearless Feline Tale, or How I Learned About Love and Life with a Blind Wonder Cat, Spray Anything, More True Tales of Homer and the Gang, and The Book of Possum, Head Bonks, Raspy Tongues, and 101 Reasons Why Cats Make Us So, So Happy. We're here to celebrate all things feline and to tell inspirational cat tales. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to an all-new episode of Curl Up with a Cat Tale with Gwen Cooper. I am, of course, Gwen Cooper, and delighted as always to be back with you here this week after taking a week off last week for a little bit of a vacation. Um, I, I was going to say well-earned because I feel like that's how you always precede the word vacation. I was taking a well-earned vacation I'm not sure how well earned it was to tell you the truth, especially given that, um, you know, I spent essentially almost the better part of an entire year in lockdown during which I cannot say I was as productive work wise as I've ever been. But nevertheless, uh, Lawrence and I decided to, to take a quick little vacation to the beach and it was just delightful. And I came back, uh, brown as a berry, as my grandmother would say, and refreshed, renewed and ready to dive back into the podcast and to talk to our special guest later on today. Her name is Beth Gammy and she is a, with a wonderful organization called Red Rover that I am so excited to tell you guys about. Red Rover um, is a relief organization for pets, basically. And what they do is they provide financial and other resources to low-income individuals or people escaping from domestic violence situations. And that is with the goal of helping people and their pets stay united, even through poverty or domestic abuse. They also respond to disaster situations, both natural disasters such as you know hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, etc., and also man-made shall we say, disasters, including hoarding situations in puppy mills, things like that. Again, they they rescue animals from these situations, but more to the point, they provide emergency shelter and and relief. Um, what's the word I'm looking at? Well, relief. They provide relief. And last but not least, they also have a program where they go into schools and they provide educators with materials and resources to help teach children empathy and kindness toward animals. This is a national organization, one that I only became familiar with pretty recently. Maybe some of you out there have known about these guys for a while. They have been operating since at least the 80s, so they are not a new organization but I'm so excited about their mission and the work that they do. And I'm, I'm truly, truly excited to bring a representative from that organization here to talk to you and also to talk to all of us about disaster preparedness as it regards our pets. And this is, of course, a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, pretty, I'm, I'm assuming all of you know, of course, about my experiences with September 11th. Also, growing up and living in Florida for the first 30 years of my life, uh, many, many hurricane scenarios where, you know, I've known too many people who would not evacuate from an evacuation zone because there was no place for them to take their pets and they did not want to leave their pets alone in a home that might be affected by a hurricane or a flood, which on the one hand is very, is completely understandable. And that's a real Sophie's choice kind of a scenario. But by the same token, obviously, in an ideal scenario, we would have better strategies than staying in a house about to be struck by a Category 5 hurricane and hoping for the best. So we're going to talk a little bit about disaster preparedness and some practical things that we all need to know. And that is going to be later on in today's show. First, though, we are going to talk uh, about another subject that is near and dear to my heart and that I'm pretty sure I've discussed previously on a previous episode of this podcast. And and if so, I apologize if I'm repeating myself to those of you who listen to every episode from the beginning. If you feel like this is boring or something you've already heard me discuss, then, then I apologize to you for coming back from vacation and diving into an old subject. Um, but I, I feel that I may have lost a, an old friend this week, uh, which is something that I'm very sad about. And I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about how I lost, I, I think I may have lost that friend and why and how I think that affects all of us. And I don't know if she listens to this podcast 
Uh, I'm I'm going to make up a name. I'm going to call her, um, let's say, Maria. I'm going to dress her as Maria for the purposes of this podcast. Uh, Maria, my friend who lives overseas and who has a cat who has not been well lately. And uh, so, Maria, if you are listening, I, I, I hope I'm able to say this better on the podcast than I was in our email exchange. So Maria is in a situation that many of us have found ourselves in over the years. Maria's cat is sick. Uh, she has a tumor that may or may not be cancerous. Um, and Maria has been trying to raise $6,000 for exploratory surgery and a diagnostic biopsy to determine whether or not the tumor is cancerous and also because it is it is high up in her cat's uh, nose. And so, of course, a tumor in that region does not have to be cancerous in order to be problematic. Anything that can affect the brain, obviously, can have a very negative outcome. And so Maria does not have $6,000 for this procedure. She has started a GoFundMe to which I did donate and she asked me to promote that fundraiser among my audience. And, and she saw the amazing work that we did, for example, on behalf of Kelly, the blind cat in, in Sweden, and just all the incredible things and, and fundraising efforts that Homer's Heroes have undertaken over the years. And so the first thing I, I had to say, unfortunately, and, and it was it is never easy to say, but I told her that I could not share her fundraiser with all of you, simply because I, I do not share personal fundraisers. I do not promote personal fundraisers among my listeners, my followers, my readers, the, the people who follow Homer on social media, all of you guys. It's just not something that I do. And it's not something I do for friends. It is also not something that I do for myself. And I, and, uh, not to sound too, I guess, self-justifying, but the the first thing I would say to Maria is that this is not a personal no to you. Um, I have at various times in the last decade, um, I, I have not only been in a situ in situations where I have had to come up with extraordinarily large amounts of of money to to treat my cats, but. Just in general, there there have been some difficult times, right? Just like everybody, we all face difficult times. And and when I say difficult times, I mean it's it's not even just that you are teetering on on the edge of a cliff. You have fallen off the cliff and you are hanging on to the the ledge to to try to keep from falling. And it's you know it's it's not just that you're hanging on by your fingernails; it's that your fingernails have have worn down to bloody stumps, and and those bloody stumps that you are desperately clinging to to the edge of the cliff with are the only things that are keeping you from falling into the abyss. And I, when I have been in those situations over the past few years, I have known that if I were to ask all of you for help, that, that help would be forthcoming, which makes it very difficult not to ask for help. And the reason that I never have, and, and this might this is going to sound like a line from a comic book or something, um, but I do not feel that, that I, I, I was not given the, the audience that I have to help out myself and my friends. I, I was, I, 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 have built this audience. I've worked hard. I mean, maybe I shouldn't say I was I was given. I, I've written books. I, I have put in a lot of work to to have the following that I have, but the purpose of it has not been to help myself and friends. And it of course I make money doing what I do. I, I write books, you guys buy them. I have a Patreon page that many of you support, but that's different. That that is me working for something. I have never asked my readers or my listeners or even really friends to just give me something. And that is because I, I feel very strongly that, that the purpose that I have, the, the reason why I, I have this audience is to serve a cause that is bigger than myself. And it is bigger than myself and my friends. And there is nothing that I would not personally do for my friends within, within my, the, my personal means to do so. But that, that is a different thing. Anyway, um, this is a very long answer, and I, and I may not be explaining it well, but but to Maria, I say that that I was not saying no to you because I just have a policy, and I can't break my policy. It's it is a deeply held 
uh, almost, I want to say, almost religious <laughs> belief that I have, and and it does not, it may not make sense or be as clear to anyone else as it is to me, but it is crystal clear to me. It is a bright, hard line that I just do not cross, and I have at times it has been it has cost me a, a lot more difficulty than maybe I had to face to not cross that line, but I don't cross that line, and and I just do not do it. So so that is the first thing I would say, but. More to the point, and and on a bigger, you know, on 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 the level of of the the bigger picture issue, and that is spending thousands of dollars that that you do not have on medical care for your cat that may or may not extend your cat's life by some indeterminate number of years. And I've said this before, you know, it, it, in a situation. You know, when, when Clayton had his urinary tract blockage when he was a year old, and I had to very quickly come up with $3,000 to have that treated. And in that kind of scenario where you have a cat who is one year old, you have a, a problem that is pretty easily fixed. And where, you know, once once the urinary tract blockage is cleared up, his health will be fine. And that is a problem from, from that day to this that has never recurred. And so in that kind of scenario where you have a young cat with an easily fixed problem that has a very, very high success rate in terms of responding to treatment, and it's really just going to be the one-time expense. It was that $3,000 that I had to spend to have him treated at the emergency hospital and then nothing afterwards. If you don't have that money, if not, if I had not had that $3,000, that would have been a tragedy. That, that to me is a scenario that is a genuine tragedy. A young cat, an easily solved problem that is not going to recur – and again, this is where I, I pretty much beg of you, if if you know that you would not have that kind of money in an emergency, and God knows, <laughs> so many of us, most of us do not. And, and uh, you know, I had it in credit, by the way. I, I didn't just write a check for $3,000. If you know that in that scenario, you could not come up with several thousand dollars quickly in cash or credit, I, I pretty much beg you to consider – buying health insurance for your pet. Not, I don't know how it works overseas, Maria. I don't know how it works in your country, but you should certainly, certainly look into it. But in terms of a, a let's say, a middle-aged or older cat who has a problem that something, a, a, a tumor or possibly cancer or other endemic chronic illnesses that develop. Uh, Vashti had chronic renal failure. Homer had progressive liver failure, things of that nature. I, I, again, really do want to emphasize how deeply and passionately I believe that if you have the money and if your cat will tolerate the treatment, then by all means, do as much as you feel good doing, as you want to do, as you think might be successful. I, when when Vashti had, was diagnosed with chronic renal failure, I spent ten thousand dollars to keep her alive for nine months. And I will first say I did not know at the time that I was signing on to spend ten thousand dollars. Right, that the initial treatment cost two thousand dollars. And then over the subsequent nine months, there were more issues that cropped up. She had to be hospitalized a couple more times. Those nine months, it, it not just only cost us a lot of money, it took a lot of work from both Vashti and me. And I do not regret having done it. Again, I, I had the money at the time. I had the money because I'd written a successful book about my cats. And so to spend that money on my cats felt very much like, like karmically the right thing to do. And again, I am in the somewhat unique position of being able to claim the expenses, my expenses for my cats as tax deductions, which not everybody is in a position to do. And, and it's it's not all the money in the world, but it does help offset a little bit of the cost, the money that you end up saving on your taxes. But I will say that if I had it to do all over again, I don't know if I would make the same choice and if I decided either because I didn't have the money or because the cat in question would not be as tolerant of the treatment as Vashti was, that it would not be a tragedy the way that it would have been a tragedy if Clayton had died at a year old of a urinary tract blockage. Um, when we adopt our cats, 
We are not making them a guarantee that we are going to spend a certain amount of money on them in order to guarantee or attempt to guarantee them a certain number of years or a certain length of their life. We rescue them from horrible situations, horrible lives that they would have had without us, or we take, we adopt them from the organizations that rescued them from those lives. And the promise that we make to our cats is that they will feel loved and they will feel secure. We will make them feel loved and secure every day of their lives, whether those lives are long or short. And that is our obligation. That is our only obligation. Nobody knows about anybody if a life is going to be long or short. And I, I want to make this point. I do not want to get into the argument about whether a cat's life is worth more or less than a human life, because I think it has nothing to do with the price of tea in China. It is not relevant to this conversation. I personally do not believe that a cat's life is worth less than a person's, but I do believe that there are different standards, by which I mean that the cats, first of all, do not fear the future or fear death in the abstract the way that humans do. Cats are, are not concerned with making sure they live a long life. It is not a thought that they have. I would also say that as humans, we all have different phases of our lives. We're, we're children and then we're teenagers and then we're, we're in our 20s and, and entertaining our friends and our first grown up apartments. And then we're in our 30s and 40s and we're having and raising children. And then in our 50s and 60s, the, the kids are out of the house and they're graduating high school and they're graduating college and they're getting their first grown up apartments. And, and then they present us with grandchildren. And, and obviously not everybody's life follows this exact trajectory. I myself do not have children, but we have the sense that you know, I, I'm about to turn 50 and there are a lot of things I know at 50 that I did not know at 25 and that I certainly did not know when I was 15 or 10. And to for us to miss any of those phases of our lives seems to us to be a tragedy. It is a tragedy certainly to to die so young that you never went out on your first date or graduated high school or or not to graduate college or or not to to be able to hold your grandchildren or dance at your daughter's wedding you know, cats are kittens, and then they're cats. And then at some point, hopefully after a, a long number of years, they 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 leave us. And they they do not have these different phases of life that it is not tragic for your cat to die before she can see her children graduate high school, or before she can hold her grandchildren in her arms. I, I'm not even saying this to belittle the lives that cats live. But your cat, by the time your cat is a year or two old, has probably done everything with his life that he is going to do. And that does not mean it is not important for them to enjoy their lives or that it doesn't matter how long they live. But it is if, if your cat at, at the age of eight or nine or, or 14 or 15 becomes terminally ill, if you have given that cat years of a life filled with love and security, then you have done everything for that cat. You have already done everything that matters. You do not have to bankrupt yourself. You do not have to spend yourself into ruinous debt, trying to come up with money you do not have in an attempt that may, by the way, ultimately prove unsuccessful to try to stretch an eight-year life into a 10-year life or a 12-year life into a 14-year life. Again, if you have the money and if your cat will tolerate the treatment, then by all means, do what you feel is right and best. But if you do not have that kind of money, I, I promise you, I say this from my heart with, with so much love for the love that you have for your cat, you are not failing your cat, and it is not a tragedy. The reason why I say that I don't know I, if I would make the same decision regarding Vashti if I had it to do over again is because I, I know now that it, if Vashti had died at 14 instead of 14 in nine months, it would not have been a tragedy. 
it would have been a success story because the success story is the 14 years of life and love that we had together, not the few months at the end where maybe I couldn't do everything I wanted to do. And I will conclude this by saying, um, and those of you who read the sequel to Homer's Odyssey know this, the only thing in this world that Homer was scared of was the vet, and he was terrified, and, and a lot of cats are scared of that, and it was just not the same. Homer was not just scared of the vet. He was – he really – I'm not even saying this is an exaggeration or a joke. He literally and truly believed that they were trying to kill him at the vet's office, and he reacted – Every time as if it were a threat to his life and it became more and more difficult to even control him at the vet's office long enough for them to draw blood. As as the years went by, it, it became a worse and worse experience physically and emotionally for all of us. And at the end of Homer's life, when he went into liver failure, they told me that without extraordinary levels of of medical intervention that he would die within two weeks, that if I did not, in essence, do as much for him as I did for Vashti a few years earlier, that he would be dead within two weeks. And it was the hardest decision I have ever had to make. And I made the decision to let him go in two weeks if that's what it took, because I was not going to extend his life at, at the expense of, of giving him additional months or years filled with terror, terror of the vet, terror of me, of, of, of the shots that I would have to give him and the pills I would have to shove down his throat, the only person in his life he had ever completely trusted who had never betrayed him to, to suddenly, in, in his mind, I, I, I was not going to put him through that. Um, as it happens, he ended up living another nine months because Homer w- was stubborn and tough and uh, never he, – he always beat everybody's predictions for him. But I, I guess the point I'm making is that I, I know what I'm talking about as I give my advice to you, Maria, and to the rest of you who are listening. Uh, my situation, granted, it was not a situation where I did not have the money. Um, I had to – I made the decision I made for different reasons – But I did make the decision to do nothing beyond palliative care. And it was a difficult decision to reach. But once I reached it, I made my peace with it. And I do not regret it for an instant now. And my reasons for not regretting are not because Homer ended up living another nine months instead of two weeks, but because if I had it to do again, knowing to a certainty that it would only be two weeks, then it would only be two weeks and so be it. Um, Because again, what matters is is not the end. It's everything that comes before that. And Maria, you rescued a cat from an abusive situation. She had a horrible life until you took her in and gave her love. And you have since that, since then, every day you have given her a life filled with love. And that is a miraculous thing in this world. And that is, a, no matter how the story ends, that is a success. That is your success. And I I certainly, I, I hope whatever, however this works out or whatever decisions you come to and whatever the, the medical tests end up saying, you are in my heart. I know you'll be in the hearts of many people who are listening to this. We we all know what you are going through. We, we all sympathize with your pain. And we are all grateful to you for how much you love this cat. And because when we hear of a cat who's been rescued from an abusive situation and is transported from that abuse into a new life that is filled with love and joy and security and happiness every single day, we know that it's a success story and it's the kind of success story that inspires all of us and makes us all do the the things we do that are for animals that are difficult at times, but this is why we do it. And so I, I wish you and your cat, Maria, the very best of luck. And I hope you know that I am your friend and I am have always been your friend and I will always be your friend. Anything I can do for you, please just let me know. And speaking of the things that we do for our friends, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my friends and, and my Patreon community for all of the support that they offer to me in allowing me to continue to do this work that I do and my ability to work independently, to write 
my books and to produce this co- uh, podcast independently of both traditional publishers and corporate sponsors. And we are going to talk to Beth Gammy over at Red Rover in just a moment. But before then, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the, the first third of my Patreon supporters, uh, people who, who participate in this community at the $5 level per month or higher. And if you do not hear your name today and, and you are one of those people, I, it's, it's a very long list. I cannot read it all at once. So I read it in shift. So this is the first shift. And if you don't hear your name today, you will probably hear it next week or the week after. Um, but I would like to offer a very special thanks to Stephanie Race. And by the way, if I mispronounce your name, please, for the love of Pete, email me, Gwen at GwenCooper.com, and let me know. So thank you to Stephanie Rayson, Andrea Kenner, Penny Nakatsu, Cindy Settle, Grace Brown, April Crawford, Nita Mercer, Linda Chase, Anne Tate Meyer, Marie Cisneros, Dawn Cole. Ronald Coltnow, Allison Amsterdam, Christina DeSalvo, Hella Johnson, Melissa Bennett Rochko, D. Cab, Ken Kistner, Cynthia Erdley, Nancy Ross, Meg, last name withheld, Emily Stafford, Jill Graves, Debbie Bradley, Amy Neal, Angela Carter, Kathy Schlichterlein, Margaret Ald Louis. Stephanie Peters, Heather Hambrick, Aldana Bermontas, and Eileen Kaiser, and Calvin, her kitty Calvin. A big thanks to all of you. And I'm going to take just a short break now for about 30 seconds or so. And when I come back, I will be speaking with Beth Gammy at Red Rover. So I encourage you to sit back, get comfortable, and stick around for more Curl Up with a Cattail. Thanks so much for sticking around. Today's guest is the Director of Field Services for Red Rover, a national animal welfare nonprofit. She leads the Red Rover Responders Program, which provides emergency animal sheltering in natural disasters and large-scale cruelty seizures throughout the U.S. and Canada. She has experience in leading large-scale TNR operations and has developed a comprehensive manual, Humanely Managing Cat Overpopulation Sites. She regularly leads trainings for humane societies, animal control agencies, and emergency response groups on emergency animal sheltering, and also presents on topics such as compassion resilience, large-scale TNR, and animal well-being in emergency shelters. I am thrilled and honored to have her join us this week. Please welcome Beth Gammy. Hello. Hey, Gwen. Really, thanks so much for having me. I, I sure appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here. Am I pronouncing your name correctly, by the way? I, I always have a thing. People can should feel free to correct me. I want to be right about this. So it is Beth Gammy. Yes, it is. you got it right. All right. And, um, you know, I usually save this for the end, but I want to get this out right up top just because people don't always stick around all the way to the end. Um, but real quick, if people want to know more about the work you do, the amazing work that you guys do and give you money, where can they go? They should, um, they should go to redrover.org. Um, and, uh, it, it, right at the homepage, you see the three programs that Red Rover has and we're the Red Rover responders, but, uh, really invite everybody to check out all of our programs. Okay, now now having sort of, sort of skipped to the end, we're we're going to go <laughs> back to the beginning, um, and and you know, I because I really think that that when people learn more about what you guys do, they're going to be as excited as I am. There there's so many different programs and 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 situations that you respond to that are causes that are very near and dear to my own heart. Um, you know, and I, I have to say, sort of an aside, I I get emails all the time from people who've read my books, you know, telling me what a good person I am. And I am, it, it's so nice to hear, except that I'm always mindful of the fact that there are people like you 
who are the genuinely good people doing amazing work. And um, really more people should know about you than know about me. So so hopefully we're going to we're going to start to write that wrong right here on today's podcast. Um, but tell us a little bit about Red Rover and, and how you guys got started. Well, um, so uh, Red Rover um, actually was started in 1987 in Sacramento, California, and that's where our national headquarters is, and was started by, um, you know, a a group of uh, animal lovers, and we've really uh, kind of changed and evolved and grown over the years, and it was in 2011 that we we uh, rebranded as Red Rover. So it's it's been 10 years now that we've been known as, as Red Rover. And, uh, you know, we have uh, three main programs. And I, it is now a good time to go into that, just to let you know the different things we do? Absolutely. Please do. Okay. Fantastic. So um, uh, Red Rover Relief is our, our program that really helps uh people and animals um, financially in in crisis. And so we have uh, urgent care grants, which um, are uh, uh, grants for veterinary emergencies. And we, um, when the pandemic started, we started a a COVID emergency boarding program where we will pay for um, boarding uh, someone's animals if they are, uh, stricken with COVID and hospitalized, um, or if they've, uh, you know, kind of gone back home, but because of their physical condition, they really need help taking care of their pets. I, uh, I see, uh, I, I can actually see you. We, we do this podcast audio only, but, but via Zoom, I see you on video and I see that, uh, that a cat has joined the proceedings. I just figured yes. I would point that out. A little, yes. a little ginger guy I'm seeing. Yep. That would be, uh, that would be Tab who I, uh, rescued off the uh, streets in Sacramento when I lived there. And, and of course, he has made himself right at home, I see. Yes. Your, <laughs> from a street cat to an office cat, he has made the transition very successfully. Yes, he's, yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. Um, and, and, and I just want to, buy, I'm sorry, and, and you know, all in and of itself, I, I think the work you're doing with COVID relief is, is tremendous. This is, you know, I hear from from people, my, my cats, you know, I'm one of those people with, with cats who have a big social media following. And so I have heard, I, I hear from people all the time, especially since COVID, <clears throat> sorry, has started, uh, you know, who are in a situation where they are hospitalized or, or they're moving in into, you know, they, they are not going to be home due to health reasons for some extended period of time and, and pleading for some sort of assistance, somebody to help them, somebody to adopt their cats and so, I mean, that, that you guys even do more than that is amazing because this in and of itself, I, I think, is just such an amazing thing. It must be a tremendous relief for the people who need it. And, and is this something you, a program that you administer throughout the U.S. or is it only in certain geographical regions? Yeah, so all our programs are throughout the United States. And, you know, just to take a, a half step back, you know, at Red Rover, we are really just hugely focused on the human-animal bond. And we're, we're an animal welfare organization that, that really thinks about the animals, people as well. And when you I'm help, not- uh, no, I'm sorry. And I, again, but this is, this is something that I say all the time, a point that I always emphasize that when you help animals, you help people too. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that other groups don't, don't do animal groups, don't do that as well, but we really consciously think about it. And, you know, sometimes I say, you know, well, people are animals too. And uh, <laughs> very true. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, all of us at Red Rover, we all love our animals and animals in general. And we, we think about like, what would it be like if I couldn't take care of my animals and just how excruciating that would be. And so, um, you know, when the pandemic hit, we, we started this um, grant for, for boarding. And then, you know, for, for a good number of years now, um, another part of the relief program is helping um, domestic violence survivors escape with their animals. I'm so glad you brought that up because that that is absolutely an aspect of what you talk about that that I did want to at least touch on. You know, I don't know how many people realize this, but one thing that keeps a lot of people living with domestic violence in their situation, you know, staying in in that abusive situation is a fear that is the fact that they cannot they have no place to go where they can bring their pets with them 
And they, there is a certain knowledge that if they leave their pets behind, their abuser will retaliate against them by injuring their pets. It's not even just a, it will make me so sad to live without Fluffy. It is a Fluffy might get beaten or shot to death if I am not there. And I have actually seen animals in shelters that I have visited who have been shot by domestic abusers and have survived um, I, you know, gr- gravely injured for the rest of their lives. And and so this is, I think, an, an important aspect of domestic violence that is not often considered enough. Yeah, absolutely. That is so real. And I, you know, I've worked with domestic violence survivors in another capacity before I was at Red Rover. And it was very clear. Um, abusers really know um, their, uh, their person's weak points and it's basically whatever they love. And so, you know, the, the, the violence that can happen to animals, um, it's just not, it's not theoretical um, to someone living in that situation. And it is a real reason why they stay. So, so what, what our, um, our our program does in the relief program is that we give grants uh, to people escaping domestic violence, um, if their domestic violence shelter doesn't happen to have on-site pet housing. So, so again, this is a, a program that will pay for boarding. And then also to get at kind of the root of the issue, we have grants that can go to domestic violence shelters and also animal shelters to build their capacity for housing um, uh pets that are escaping domestic violence with their person. So we've actually helped um, build on-site housing at domestic violence shelters. And uh, if a domestic violence shelter, if that isn't going to work for them, then they also have the option of working with their local shelter and increasing the, the, the shelter's ability to take on those pets. So really doing all we can to help um, people in domestic violence situations escape with their pets. You know, what I really love about your organization as a whole, and, and we're going to we're going to move into talking about disaster relief as well, is it, it you know, is, is that you rescue animals and there's a tremendous amount of good that you do for people as well, but that you really are helping families, you, the human and, and animal members of families when they are at their most vulnerable. Um, I, I know that you are in my, you're in Florida right now. I am a Florida native and, uh, you know, I've lived through, through many hurricanes. I was there for Andrew. I moved to New York a, a few months before September 11th and, and moved into an apartment three blocks away from ground zero. So I, I was out of my, my home for, for nearly a week. I didn't know if my cats were alive or dead. I didn't know if my apartment building was still standing. I, I sort of had nothing but the $20 in my pocket and the $150 I had in my, my bank account. And, and that was it. And, and so I know that that feeling of, of suddenly at your whole life is in chaos and disarray. And, and in addition to having to figure out what you're going to do for yourself, trying to make a plan for finding your pets for it, you know, securing for them, you know, help and and medical care and shelter if they need those things, um, and and so it, it's you know it's I I wish that I I wish that your name was as well known as the Red Cross just because I I wish that there were people who knew not just to donate and to sing your praises both of which you richly deserve, but also to utilize your services. I you know and and disaster preparedness is is definitely something I want to talk to you about a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, the, I I know firsthand I guess is what I'm trying to say how terrifying at least some of these situations can be. I fortunately have never been so sick that I couldn't care for my pets. And and it just really is is amazing and wonderful that there's an organization that helps people and animals. The like I said that like whole families basically when people are at their most vulnerable and their most terrified. Yeah, absolutely. And I um, I you know I'm a little familiar with you know some of the things that you have gone through with with things that you've written and um, I know, you know, and you, and you get it. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, our, our, our tagline is, uh, bringing animals from crisis to care. And, and we, we really just want to be of service. That's, you know, all of the things that we do, um, we really just want to be of service to people and their animals. You know, we don't charge for our services. We just show up and do what we can do to help. 
in our program work, we're always thinking about what are the needs out there? What are we hearing about? How, you know, how can we help? And, um, you know, the areas that we've focused on, it's, it's very conscious about how can we use our, our donor dollars um, really to make the, the, the biggest impact on people. And, um, and yeah, in these crisis situations, uh, you know, some of them are, are just life and death and people love their animals and, and we want to, um, to be there for them when they need help. I definitely want to, so, so you're the director of field operations and I, I've been to your website. I have read about the, the literally hundreds of disaster scenarios um, that you have responded to or disaster situations that, that you guys have responded to over the course of, of the last 30 some odd years that, that you have been in existence. And so, so t- talk to us a little bit about some of the things that you have, have witnessed firsthand in, in the way of disaster response, disaster situations and disaster response. Wow. Well, um, you know, I, I've been Next month, it'll be, you know, my 10-year anniversary in this position. And before that, I was a volunteer with Red Rover. You know, in natural disasters, it's, it's just like what you said. It's, it's uh, seeing people when they have gone through, you know, the absolute worst. Just the worst uh, time of their lives. Like this is, you come to people when, when the worst thing that has happened to them is in the process of happening to, him, that, to them. That's when you guys step in. Yeah. And so, you know, um, a a big part of what we do in disasters is um, help set up and operate emergency animal shelters. And so, gosh, you know, in um, Hurricane Harvey, we we helped operate Uh, a shelter in in an abandoned parking garage, you know, um, which was right nearby the human mega shelter. And, um, you know, this... I'll never forget this woman that came in and, you know, these are people that have lost everything and, um, but they have their dog or their bird, you know, or they, with their cats. And I'll never forget this woman. Um, and she, she came over to uh, visit um, her little terrier and like, she raised her hands up, you know, and she's like, I carried him out over my head above the floodwaters. And, um, and she was just so grateful to see like to the level of care the animals were getting there and how careful we were. And, um, God, it's that just kind of epitomized, you know, some of the things that we see then, you know, of course, you know, when we're deployed, you know, you drive through the communities that are just ripped up by tornadoes, you know, or hurricanes. Or when we're out in California, you know, we're all breathing that same smoky air. And, you know, you just, you see people at like the Red Cross shelter or, or coming to visit their pet. And a lot of them are just shell shocked. But when they see their animal and when their animal sees them, you know, it is just as if they're like, wow, wow. I, I have, I still have you. Well, that's the and, moment that, that, re, that the, the sort of reconstruction of your life begins. I, I, I can say, and again, at least from my own perspective, um, after September 11th, and it's astonishing to me that we were coming up on the 20th anniversary now, it, you know, part of me knows it was such a long time ago. And, and yet there's a part of me for whom it, it, it's just always going to be a very fresh and vivid memory. Um, and and look, I am as attached to my stuff as as anybody else. And you know, my my clothing, my photo albums, the, the the ring my grandmother left me on her deathbed, all all that sort of thing. But I can honestly say, when it, when the chips were down, when it really came down to it, and I didn't know if I had anything left in the world, my fee, I, the only thing I was thinking about was my cats. I, I can honestly say. And when I finally got back to them and saw that they were okay. That that was sort of when I began to recover from the the shock of what had happened. I realized that that for so many, I mean, for most of the people you work with, it probably is not as simple as getting back home and finding out that their home is okay. But I think they they must have that similar feeling of 
my family is intact because we all the people are here and all the animals are here and we are all going to get care. And so there is now the rebuilding of our lives can begin. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, knock on wood, I haven't uh, gone through something like that personally, although we do have the up here in Tallahassee, we're getting hit by the remnants of, you know, Tropical Storm Fred. Um, but, you know, one thing I think about, too, that I've seen over the years is um, is the kids and their pets. Uh, I remember oh, absolutely. we, we were um, deployed to Oklahoma City for the tornadoes. And, you know, the, the thing that that will just make me cry without fail and almost every responder in the shelter is when, you know, people come in and there's reunions because, uh, you know, some of the shelters we set up are, are animal only and we have animals that were rescued from the field. And so people are coming by and they're making the rounds and they're trying to see, do you have their pet? And I remember there was a family that came in to, um, uh, to reclaim their dog. And, you know, it was, you know, it just makes you melt. But um, the little girl, one of her classmates was killed. It was, it was that tornado that hit a school. And so her friend, you know, had actually been killed in this disaster. And it was so huge. I mean, she just wrapped her arms around that dog. And, you know, I just couldn't help but think that part of, you know, part of that trauma from the disaster was, you know, losing her friend, but she didn't have to go through losing her dog too. So it's just really, it can be really, uh, just really powerful and emotional. I mean, even just you describing it is, is very powerful. I'm, I'm sitting here uh, try, try, trying not to burst into tears in the, in the middle of an interview, which I have to say would, would, it would be the first time that that has happened. Um, but, but again, and, and I, this really is something I, I keep harping on this point, um, only because doing what I do for as long as I've done it, I, I'm always here. Every time I engage in any sort of major fundraising drive, on behalf of an animal rescue organization, what I always hear is why should we help animals when there are so many people in need? And aside from feeling that that is just a, a false dichotomy that, that, you know, that we, we are not in this life only allowed to care about one thing or only allowed to support one thing. Um, and the fact that I am raising money for an animal rescue organization, because I speak to animal lovers does not mean that the people who, who, pay attention to what I'm asking or that I myself are only supporting animal rescue organizations. But I also truly and and always have believed again, and I always say this, that when you help animals, you do help people as well. And, and in so many different ways. And, and again, an organization like this, just really, it, it is about so much more than rescuing animals during a crisis. It is, it is rescuing people as well. And I have no doubt that that little girl who, who witnessed such a horror and lost so much uh, again, that, that being reunited with the dog that she loves, who loves her is, is going to be an important part of her healing process. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the thing that, you know, sometimes when, um, you know, I talk with jurisdictions about, you know, uh, making sure they have a plan to shelter pets and have pet friendly shelters. And, and this really got to be better known after Hurricane Katrina and it keeps getting better, but you know, they found that like 40 to 50% of people with animals will not evacuate um, in a disaster. That was actually something else I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah. Um, Again, having grown up in Miami and this was something in our family and we lived only a couple of blocks outside of an evacuation zone uh, that, that was always evacuated during hurricanes. And we never, you know, technically we didn't have to, but when you're only three blocks outside of the evacuation zone, it is certainly something you should be thinking about. Um, and we never did, not when I was growing up and not after I had left the house and my, pa- my parents uh, were down there on their own they would never have left our dogs. That was just the deal. There was no place to bring the dogs. Ergo, there was no place for us to go. Right. And, you know, and it, so it's really a matter of of public safety. Like you will not get the numbers of people to evacuate if you don't provide places for them where they can bring their pets. And 
there's really, you know, a movement and it continues and grows. And I think it's, I think we're reaching the tipping point and it's almost getting to the point where people are really expecting that and asking, okay, well, where are the pet shelters? Or, you know, when, sure. when you know, when you see the postings for, you know, a disaster shelter, you know, people are asking, well, okay, what kind of animals do you take in? And, and that's really great. I remember one time, um, uh, early on in my career, somehow my um, cell number, which is the emergency contact number for Red Rover, somehow it got shared. I think it was uh, Mobiles 211. So when people were calling in with questions for uh, disaster, um, it, during a disaster, it was going to, to my cell phone. And I got this call from this woman and she, they were just about to get slammed by a hurricane. And she had um, her husband's service dog and her husband had already passed away. And she, uh, she was not going to leave her mobile home unless she could take this dog. And it was her last link to her husband and she loved the dog too. And, um, you know, so I I did some legwork and, and found a shelter, but, you know, here's this elderly lady with very few resources and the last link to her husband and she has no shelter um, in a hurricane in a mobile home. And, you know, it was just, it was really great that they had a pet friendly shelter. And so that's what I'm saying. It's just real. it's not hyperbole to say it's life. It's life or death. Sometimes like people will not leave. And some of them that do not leave, because of their pets, they will not survive. So I, I, I feel so passionate about, about our disaster work. Yeah, no, and, and I'm confident that many of the people listening to this right now are saying to themselves, I, I would not leave. I would not leave my, my cat, my dog, the, the animal that I love behind. And I, I certainly have heard a, a lot, again, over the years of, well, those people are foolish and, and, You know, like the implication being that they are making bad choices and therefore don't deserve the help. And and I I think at a certain point, you really it does. It's not even about right or wrong or smart or foolish. It's just a a question of what is and then adjusting the resources available for disasters to what is. I see you're turning the camera around so that I (laughs) I can see your your (laughs) your little guy again. Um, But like it, it just you know, I, I hate saying this because it's so reductive, but it is what it is. People are not going to abandon their pets in a, in a disaster scenario. And the truth of the matter is you don't want them to, and not just because it would make them feel bad, but because in a recovery situation, you don't need desperate, hungry, frightened animals wandering around a, a disaster zone, trying to fend for themselves and then encountering people who are coming in either to to clean things up or to reclaim belongings or to rescue people who might still be there. It's just not a good situation for anybody yeah and and really the answer is it's it's not to really microanalyze like whether it was a good choice to stay or not but look at like what keeps people from evacuating we know we we know huge numbers won't evacuate if you can't take your pet so whether you think whether you're an animal lover or not you know, um, you know, the thing for jurisdictions to do is to provide pet sheltering, which they actually, you know, have to consider pets, you know, under the, the Pets Act. And so, you know, it's it's usually not a, a, a difficult um, point to make um, with emergency managers and, and jurisdictional agencies that are responsible. Because they get it. I mean, the people who really, you know, it's one thing, everybody, everybody's got an opinion, right? But if you are a person like you are, if you are a person with your hands in this, if you're a person on the ground, actually doing the logistical and practical work of solving the problem, then you are less concerned with why the problem exists than with solutions. It, you know, it's not about looking backward toward better decisions people hypothetically could have made at some past point. It's about dealing with what the reality of the situation is at the moment. Yeah. And let's look at like, and, and so we look at like, okay, so, um, you know, cause I get calls all the time about, you know, from agencies asking advice on emergency sheltering. And that's something, I mean, we provide that consulting. I mean, we do, you know, I will work with any agency and jurisdiction, um, you know, in depth, a phone call, 
anything in between, whatever they need, because um, we just, we, we know it's, it's needed. It, you know, if, if a, you know, city or county hasn't done it before, it feels daunting, but it's really very doable. And when they start to see, you know, the resources out there, the expertise, um, you know, other agencies and nonprofits that will come in and help, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's really mission work for all of us to do this. And, you know, it gets them to start. I think it's a great way of putting it, by the way. It, it really is. Uh, it, it is mission work. It absolutely yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, it completely is. And um, so, so we help jurisdictions do that. We help individual pet owners think about what they need. And, um, you know, everyone, everyone wants to do the right thing. They just may not know what to do. So that's an excellent way of putting it. And um Speaking of, uh, and I was going to say that it really is all about education, ultimately. And um, and I'm going to ask you to give us a little bit of an education in a moment. But the last thing I wanted to talk to touch on before we we get into our own disaster preparedness um, is, is to talk about the wildfires out west. And I know you guys are, are not directly involved with with relief efforts for the the Dixie wildfire at the moment. But I also know that this is work that you guys have done, that your organization has done. And so I was hoping you might be able to talk to us a little bit about what animal rescuers or rescuers in general on the ground are facing right now and what those of us watching from afar. And I realize, again, many of my listeners are out west. They are in areas that are are either directly threatened or they they are at least inhaling all the smoke. And, and so this is not you know, I, I am safely ensconced on the East Coast, I guess, uh, just waiting out the rest of hurricane season <laughs> to see what's going to happen. But but for those of us who would like to be of some assistance to to those who are making rescue efforts on the ground right now, you know, what, what are they facing? What are they going through and what can we do for them? Well, you know, any um, any any like wildfires, especially, I mean, it really depends um, county by county. On, on what the needs are. And of course, all, all disasters are managed kind of at the county level. And then if it gets bigger than that, it goes up to, you know, a statewide emergency. But, but what they're facing really varies. Um, and, it, you know, uh, animal-wise, like pet-wise, it really kind of depends on how populated the area is that's burning. Um, and so how many evacuees there are. And um, some of the fires aren't in hugely populated areas. Some are, um, you know, we helped with the campfire and there were just a lot of people, of course, burned out of their homes. So there were a lot of evacuees and a lot of animal, you know, um, uh, disaster evacuees. And, uh, you know, they're trying to take care of the animals they're breathing in the smoke, you know, of course, in fires, you get, um, you know, a lot of burn injuries and uh, burns on the paws. And we've helped um, Haven uh, Humane Society in Anderson, California, that they're fantastic. They often take in um, animal, you know, uh, wildfire animal victims, and they, they do a lot of the, the treatment, and it's a lot of you know, changing the bandages and so on. Um, as far as what people can do, and, uh, you know, the, the thing that can help the most, um, you know, short of checking in and seeing if they need volunteers and help, but if, you know, if you're helping from afar, the really the best thing to do is, is to donate money directly because that agency or group or humane society there can it just buy or pay for exactly what they need? Buy everything they need. I'll buy all the medicine they need, buy all the food that they need, buy the blankets, buy buy everything that they need. Yeah. And, and, you know, people are so generous when there's a natural disaster. And, you know, every natural disaster I've ever uh, deployed to, there is just like literally tons, like 2,000 pound units of supplies. And, um, a lot of them aren't uh, completely used up. They may be, not be exactly what's not what needed. you need necessarily. Yeah, and it's um, and people are so earnest and generous. 
Um, but, you know, for example, um, you know, in the sheltering operation, you know, we try, uh, can try to get animals all on the same food and like on a, 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 a stomach friendly food. And if sure. we get pallets of that donated, that's what we're, that we're using. And, and uh, so oftentimes, you know, like food isn't needed. Um, and, you know, when I'm coaching jurisdictions, I, I really suggest, you know, making a really detailed list that you put on Facebook of what you need. And so that's another thing people can do is search, you know, the Facebook pages of the, you know, the agencies that are working, you know, on, on the disaster that they want to help out with and look for those specific lists. But, um, you know, uh, honestly, uh, money to those groups are are just really the, the, the best thing unless they are listing out supplies they need that, that might be hard to get. Um, so uh, this, you know, if, if this summer has shown us anything, and, and this really seems to be like, like a, a catastrophic summer in so many ways. And, mm-hmm. and again, I say this as, as somebody who grew up with an annual hurricane season, I, I just don't remember uh, a, a year when there, there seems to be such a confluence of so many different kinds of disasters happening around the world simultaneously. We've had just in the last couple of weeks, wildfires, uh, you know, across the United States, Canada and Europe, flood, catastrophic flooding, an enormous earthquake in Haiti, heat waves, uh, a couple of of potential hurricanes making their way toward us right now. And I I think if there's one thing that we are hopefully all learning at this point and, and not to sound like the Grim Reaper or anything, but truly disaster can strike any of us at any time. And, and this is in the midst of a pandemic, which I know uh, certainly two years ago at this time, none of us w- w- wasn't even if you would ask somebody to name the things to worry about disasters that might strike. I don't think pandemic would have been in anybody's top 10 or, or 20 even. And and so really no, nobody is immune. I, I think the idea that there are certain places where you don't have to worry as much about natural disasters or sudden catastrophes or some places are safer or quieter than others is, is I mean, there are fires. It's Siberia is on fire. I, I, I don't even know what to do. Like Siberia is the synonym for cold and it's on fire. So, the, of course, the big question that I have is and, and obviously there's only so much you can do and, and we just have to make our peace with the uncertainty, I guess. But what are some things that any of us can do right now to to give ourselves and our pets the best possible head start, let's say, in in the event of some sort of catastrophic disaster? Well, there's really, you know, there's a a good number of things you can do. And and these things are really important because when something hits, you don't necessarily have the time. To make no, it you don't. Or, or the, or the, the wherewithal, you know, or the mental clarity. Let's say that the presence and of mind. Yeah, you may not have panicking. the time. You may not have the money. You may uh, realize, oh, I need uh, plastic crates to evacuate with my pets, and PetSmart is out because there's a run on. I mean, so, so you know, the the really, I want people um, with uh, pets to think about, okay. How can I safely contain them if I have to evacuate with all of them? And then think about uh, where, you know, like, where would I go? And like the first one, how would I safely evacuate? So really, I, I you know, for cats, everyone has to have their their own carrier, plastic carrier. And and is plastic better than cloth? If, if you have a cloth carrier, should you invest in an emergency plastic carrier or does it not really make a difference? Well, um, that's a good question. I haven't even haven't actually really thought about that. But I think if you've got a really good, um, you know, solid, uh, you know, cloth carrier for your cat that that he or she is comfy. in, I think that's 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 great. Um, you know, I think about like a, a plastic um, uh, carrier. Cause I think, um, a little sturdier, you know, maybe it's sturdier if you have to stack them. Um, also I think about getting one a little bit bigger. So you have room for a little litter box in there because right. you want to plan for your animal, um, potentially being in there a lot longer than usually the trip to the vet or taking them on the subway. Sure. 
I mean, you may be in your car for 12 hours. Right. Think about your evacuating um, the interstates backed up. You may have to travel a lot further than you think to find a pet friendly hotel. You know, if, <clears throat> if hoteling it is, is the route you're taking. So uh, you want them to have uh, more room than, than usual, um, than your typical um, just. So you, so you should get a plastic carrier, maybe a little bit bigger. You know, my, my plastic carriers uh, my and my cloth carriers too are, of a size where one cat fits in and they fit in for, and they have room to, to move around some, but there's not necessarily room to, to stuff much of anything else in there. So you're suggesting yeah. that we should have even a larger carrier that we can fit more, more into. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit bigger. And you can make little, you know, mini litter boxes out of like, you know, uh, a, you know, a so shoe box or like something like that. Yeah. It's, it's not necessarily, a, um, you know, like a, a, a huge one that you'd fit a full size litter box. That, that would have to be a big carrier to, yeah, to, right. to fit our, yeah. our whole litter box. in. Yeah. And then, um, you know, uh, plastic crates uh, for your dog. So a lot of people are like, well, gosh, my dog is so friendly, easy to handle. You know, they can load up in the car. Great. And, and that's, and that is really great. And if you don't have a plastic crate and you can, your dog can jump in the, the back seat, then, then do and evacuate. But, you know, you may end up at an emergency shelter and like the, the cohabitated shelters where people really sleep and live right next to their pets, they all require that you, um, that you do crate your animal at night. I think it's also worth noting and especially with dogs who are very protective, um, that your sweet, friendly dog who who would never hurt anybody in in a in a situation like that where where lives are threatened, where it's very high stakes, where there's a sudden evacuation and it's scary and everybody is scary, scared and tense and on edge, your dog may not react as he normally would or as you would expect him to, and and also you will be interacting at a shelter if there are other animals there your dog might be safer from those other dogs in, in a crate. Uh, So you can count on that. I mean, it is going to be, uh, you are going to be super stressed and, uh, I have just yet to see a totally calm, peaceful animal walk into an emergency shelter because they're going to be, I mean, you're going to be gathering things up. You're going to be loading in the car and driving away. That process in itself is stressful. You might be on the road for a long time. Um, and they're going to pick up on your tension. I, I think your, your animals and they're going to figure if you're nervous, it's probably because you need protection from something and dogs are protective and they don't know what to protect you from. And always keep in mind that, that animal, there's always a level of unpredictability, no matter how long you have had an animal or, or how well behaved or friendly or sweet. He, not only you believe he is, he may actually be, but we all get a little, we all do things under stress. That yeah, we of, course, of course, completely. And, you know, you may be, um, you know, trying to um, get into a, a hotel or a motel that doesn't accept pets. And uh, a lot of uh, chains, you know, and the hotels do make exceptions for animals during disasters. But gosh, you can say, look, I've got a crate. I'm going to be keeping my dog in a crate when they're not with me. Um, that makes it much more likely you'll be able to to walk in in the door. So it's um, it, it's just really a, a a good idea to to have crates. So I you know when I started doing this work and I realized this, I I went out and I got I got crates for all of my cats and my dog and um, just made sure I had them. And you want to make sure they can all fit in your car or vehicle and. Uh, if not, you know, you you think about, OK, well, these two cats are buddies. Um, I can put them maybe in one K, you know, and you really want to game it out. So literally everyone can fit in. I think you also and, and we haven't talked about this. You know, one thing after September 11th that they were really emphasizing in New York was the idea of a go bag that you should have, uh, you know, it's sealed in plastic, your important documents, uh, marriage certificate, birth certificate. Uh, any a few days supply of any medication that you may need to take and and all of that, if not literally in a bag next to your door, in some way packaged up and easy to grab. I, I can tell you right now, 
my when we're not traveling, my husband and I, our passports, our marriage certificate, our birth certificates, um, a couple, you know, a handful of other important documents are are in a Ziploc bag that are in, in the top of my underwear drawer. That it's just super easy if I'm packing to run out quickly, I, I can grab it and go. And and so you should. I, I'm thinking probably also have something like that for your pets. If your pet, look, my cats w- w- can and will eat anything. But if you have cats who have specific dietary needs or if they're on medication, you might also want to think about having a, a, you know, a couple days extra supply that is at least grouped together someplace where it's very easy for you to just grab and go without having to think about it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, of course, uh, pet medications um, have them together. But what I, you know, what what's, you know, uh, happened in the, you know, 20 years since, you um, uh, 911 is of course you know uh the cloud and so i really su- suggest to people that they put all their pet vaccination records and any medical information like that um you know uh put save it in a dropbox file or their icloud account um or just take a picture of it you know with their cell phone have that on their phone but also uh, which is a great it. idea by the way yeah a, a so, great yeah. suggestion Yes, that you can access or someone else can access for you. Right. Now, um, and and get those uh, for your pets. Also suggest people have really good photos of their pets. Have those on your phone. But, you know, think about you may lose your phone, you know, and upload those as well. And that's also very handy. Um, It's really... Think about what you might need to reunite if you and your pet or God forbid, if you're separated somehow, um, what you might need to help somebody else reunite you with your pet. Yeah, absolutely. Identify it if you get separated from your pet, you know, like as you experienced, I mean, there may be a disaster that happens while you're not at home. Right. You know, and your pet is behind and and it's rescued and and taken to an emergency shelter and uh, and you go there and, and need to reclaim it. And we are very careful we make sure that we that we don't give pets away to someone that's not the owner. And, and one of the one of the best ways is, you know, pictures, take a get a good picture of you with your pet. Now, you know, I can see that picture of you on my Zoom screen, you know, you with your uh, cute little cat. And of course, so <laughs> many of us have uh, pictures of our pets on our phone. I was going to say this is actually the easiest and most fun part of disaster preparedness that we've talked about so far. <laughs> it, it's such a great reason to take lots and lots of pictures of your pets. Yeah, yeah, and, and who doesn't like taking pictures of their cats? Yeah, right, exactly. Who doesn't? And you know, there's a um, there's also something that people can do, and this is uh, something that I, I've learned about just recently. Um, a Petco Love. Uh, is an organization and it used to be the Petco Foundation and they actually have um, a a program Petco Love Lost that's totally focused on reuniting pets and um, and so not just in disasters you know just lost or found pets and you can actually go on it's a lost.petcolove.org And you can actually upload a picture, you know, a good facial picture, you know, of your pet's face. And there's actually um, pretty good uh, facial recognition uh, programs out there. And they um, and that's what they use. And there are, gosh, I think, gosh, over 50,000 animals in that database. A lot of shelters now are taking uh, photos of the animals as they're adopted and uploading it into that. So you could actually upload the photos of your animals one by one with your contact information. And if your animal is ever separated from you and someone finds it, um, you know, and, and searches through in this, this database is, you know, when, when you search on it, it, it searches all the different, um, you know, all the different animals in that database. So that's another way that photos can be used. That, that actually sounds like a great resource and, and one that I was not aware of. So, so thank you for letting us know all about it. And, and once again, this has been a great conversation and, uh, and, and a nice, a nice long one, which I love. And uh, once again, if people would like to to learn more about the work that you do or to support it, which I absolutely encourage everybody listening to do, where can they go? How can they find out more? What can they do to help you guys out? 
They should go really straight to uh, redrover.org. And um, that talks about all our programs. And if you are intrigued or interested at all in disaster work, um, click on the responders program and it will take you through how to become a volunteer and start to do the, you know, the kind of work that we do. Well, Beth, thank you so, so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your taking the time and thank you to everybody who has been listening. And I certainly hope you will join us next week for another episode of our podcast. And um, yeah, Definitely check out redrover.org. Uh, like I said, it's, it's a tremendous organization that does amazing work. And I, I think you're going to find it very rewarding to learn more about them. Thanks again, Beth, for joining us. Thanks so much, Gwen. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. And that concludes this episode of Curl Up with a Cat Tail with Gwen Cooper. Don't forget to invite your feline-loving friends to listen to new episodes along with you. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, find out how to get your name and your cat's name included in my next book, or leave comments or questions for me to answer in future podcasts, head on over to GwenCooper.com now. Thanks so much for joining me, and don't forget to hug your cat today.